Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity again. It's, uh, it's an absolute blessing to be with you. For, before I uh, share uh, the word, I would like to ask you to actually turn to Deuteronomy chapter 9. So go to Deuteronomy chapter 9 in your Bibles. There is no PowerPoint today. I thank God for that because I've not been doing so great with PowerPoint. So I'm going to steer away from it. But before the message, uh, I just want to say thank you for to Wendy and uh, Ali just uh, preparing the songs every uh, Sunday morning. It is beautiful to worship together. It is to, to just to enjoy, uh, uh, you know, listening to some great worship songs. Thank you. And also for, to all the church, I think, you know, you've just been an amazing, uh, amazing disciples, uh, just committed, uh, really doing the very best you can in these difficult times. And who knows, this seems to continue on uh, still. Um, I don't know how long it's going to be, but I tell you what, I, I yearn to be able to meet you physically and spend this time together. Uh, I don't want to get used to this thing too much. I want to get to used to getting to my car, driving to a place where I can have a cup of tea with some of you and have a bit of fellowship in the morning and then uh, just have some worship together and sing and clap and just enjoy one another's company. It's just something wonderful. But uh, uh, so, yeah, let's continue on. But appreciate every one of you and especially those who are visiting with us as well. You know, if you're not a member of the church and you're just visiting, uh, we're so glad you can be with us and uh, you can participate with us as we study the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, we are actually, uh, we have a theme for this year, just for you to know. The theme is like-minded in Christ, like-minded in Christ. This is all the UK churches are kind of studying, uh, but the messages are all different from every region every uh, every uh, country <laughs> every part of the united kingdom is everything is slightly different and uh, we're in our first quarter which is really uh, to guide us to be in our devotion to god in our devotion to god that's the first quarter of the like mind in christ so why don't we go ahead and start reading together and today's title is not because of your righteousness or in other words, not because of our righteousness. So let us continue. We will read from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 1 to 6. And I will start reading now. Hear, O Israel, you are now about to cross the Jordan to go in a land, to go in and dis dispossess nations greater and stronger than you, with large cities that have walls up to the sky the people are strong and tall anarchites like me <laughs> i was oh, sorry i was a bit of a joke there you know about them and how and have heard it said who can stand up against who can stand up against anarchites but be assured today that the lord your god is the one who gives goes across ahead of you like a devouring fire he will destroy them. He will subdue them before you and you will drive them out and annihilate them quickly as the Lord has promised you. After the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourselves, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No, it is not account of the, no, it is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you, or it is not, it is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going to take possession of it, of their land, but on the account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Understand then that it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good and beautiful land to possess. For you are a stiff-necked people. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, blessed Lord, what a blessing it is, Lord, to look at your word so that, Lord, it can really penetrate our hearts 
and remind us, Father, who we are and who you are. And we thank you for your goodness because, Lord, we need to hear your word and help us, Lord, to really allow your word to change and help us, Lord, to, to be the people you want us to be. We love you and praise you in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Before we get into the story, I want to share a story about my life with you. I don't know if you have ever been in front of a court and have been found guilty. Well, that is me. I was in front of a court many years ago and I was found speechless and found completely and complete, completely and utterly guilty. So this is how it was actually. I was actually, I had a, for those of you who are car fanatics like me, I like sports cars, fast, furious, and uh, beautiful, sparkling cars. So I had a 2.8 Ford Capri injection. Some of you may recognize. <laughs> it going back a few years, but they are still uh, desirable. Anyway, I had one of these cars. And I was driving a brother who was in the ministry many, many years ago. I don't want to name his name because I don't want to put him into any trouble. He was with me on my left hand side. And he said, I have a mission to accomplish tonight. And I need to get down to Manchester from London. And we finished our midweek service. And I said, don't worry. We have a mission to God. I will take you in my sports car 2.8 injection and I will get you there quickly and anyway we got in the car and I drove and I was driving on the motorway on the M1 this is many many years ago and the brother sitting next to me said do you think you're not speeding I said well don't worry it's a mission from God we are going doesn't matter what happens <laughs> so anyway I was driving 134 miles an hour. Do not broadcast this, please. It's not something I'm proud of. But anyway, the police, obviously, on the cameras, they saw this car in a lightning speed going. I'm not proud of it, and that's the honest truth. But that's what I did. And the police didn't attempt to stop me, by the way, because it was too, too dangerous at a speed like that. So what they did, they spoke to another Panda car five miles down the line. And the Panda car went on the motorway, put the blue light on. And I got gone to the third lane and it slowed every traffic to slow me down. And the Panda car took me on the side slowly. And being a Christian obedient to God. I didn't argue. I just drove to the left. And the car, police car said to me, well, do you know what you were doing on the, how, what was your speed? I said, well, quite a bit. Uh, at one point I looked at it and he said, well, we have clocked you over a hundred miles an hour. And, uh, well, it was far more. It was 134 miles an hour at one point anyway. So they said, we can't give you a ticket. You have to go to the court. This is, this is out of our jurisdiction. This is too big. You have to go to the court, a magistrate. And I was somewhere in the, mid, in the Midlands, somewhere there. I can't remember exactly where. So they gave me a ticket and they said, drive home carefully now, but you will have to go to the court. You will be reported. So I was reported and a month or two months later, I went to the court. And I stood there and there was a police officer on my right. There were three judges in front, in sitting in front of me. And they said, Rubik Galustians, we've looked at your driving license. You have gone almost twice the speed limit because it was 70 miles an hour speed limit, unless you're overtaking for a few seconds or something. But anyway, and he said, the judge said there was a lady on the right and another gentleman on the left, they were counseling and they, they wanted to pass the judgment. They said, is there anything you want to tell us before we pass judgment? Do you have anything to say? I said, well, 
Your Honor, I'm sorry to be here. I want to just say I want to repent. That's what the Bible says. Repent and don't do this again. This is not right. And uh, that's all I can tell you. I am guilty. And that's all I said to the guy. Not much. And the judge looked at me. He was a, quite an elderly guy. Must have been in his like, you know, 70 or something. And he looked at me and he said, okay, sit down. And then uh, I sat down and then they confirmed. And then they said to me, stand up before we pass the judgment. And the police was standing there. And they said, well, we are going to ban you with the minimum we can give you because of your license and the way you've responded to us. Uh, and we give you 30 days uh, of ban and a 120 pound fine. So I asked the judge, could I possibly drive home and then start the ban? And the judge said, no. The band starts now. you got to get a train and to get back and you can get some, send somebody to come and collect your car, but you can't drive it. So that was it. I was found guilty. I was completely and utterly guilty. I had nothing to stand on. But I don't honestly know why the judge to this day was so lenient because it should have been like six months ban and about 300 pound fine because it was extremely dangerous because I had broken the law the Smith limit, I had endangered my passenger's life, uh, I had endangered so many other cars, I had endangered almost the whole motorway, they could have been a serious crash if I had a blow, I was guilty, but I didn't get what I deserved really, I was, I was acquitted very lightly, and I still remember it, but isn't that really the case for all of us, that we are all in the sight of God. We have all gone wrong. One way or another, we are all guilty. And God is telling them, it is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you're going to have this beautiful land and you're going to possess and you're going to live. It is because of my promise. I made a promise to Abraham. You know, in Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3, this is what the Lord says. The, look, the Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Amazing. You know, God was going to bring them into this amazing, beautiful land filled with milk and honey. And to give it to them. And it wasn't because of their righteousness. It wasn't because they what they deserved. It wasn't because they, because they had been so good. You know, we, my first point is, Undeserved mercy, undeserved mercy, undeserved blessings, undeserved grace, and this beautiful promise of this lovely land. They had done nothing. In fact, in the same chapter, if you do it in your quiet time, they were rebellious. They were stiff-necked people. And Moses pleaded for their lives so many times and God relented you know isn't that what we have received under the new covenant we have been given a gift not what we deserve in Romans chapter 6 says it is the gift of God it is simply a gift that we have this amazing forgiveness of life through our wonderful savior in John chapter 1 verse 16 says, out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace. If you like the old, old uh, NIV 94 says, one blessing after another blessing. For the law was given through Moses, but the grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What an amazing God we have. Do you know, my past, drives me to look forward and to love God more. 
Because when I look at my past, I think of who I was. And when I look at what God is intending to do, I, I am amazed. I, I honestly, I cannot but just to thank God. I'm like, Lord, thank you. How can I ever, I don't have words to say. What can I offer you? What can I give you that is right? What could even be close to what you're doing to me? You know, our past should keep us humble. And his love should drive us forward. Our past should keep us humble. And our uh, and his love should drive us forward. And this is Apostle Paul. He was driven because he remembered who he was. You know, he was filled with so much thankfulness, Apostle Paul. He writes in Romans, I want to do what is right, but I can't do it. I'm, I'm in this body of sin. And who is going to rescue me from this? But then in the very last scripture says, but thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ. That's Romans 7.25. He recognized the good that was happening to him. In 1 Corinthians 15.10, he says, but the grace of God, by the grace of God, I am who I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. And then he qualifies it so beautifully. He says, no, it wasn't actually me. But it was the grace of God that was with me. It was the thankfulness. It was the spirit of, I am so blessed because I have this incredible love of God that is driving me forward. You know, in 1 Timothy 1.15, this is years later. This is not at the beginning of his journey, Paul says. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Do you, when you see the, the goodness of God, the blessing of God heading towards eternity, does that humble you? Does that make you think, Wow, I don't deserve this. And yet I am on this journey. What an amazing journey. And this is not because of what I have done or who I am, what achievements I've done. In fact, I've been the opposite. I've been rebellious. God had to orchestrate so many people in my life for me to respond even to him. It took so much for him to get my attention. You know, now... Years later, I look at myself and I think to myself, are you speeding like you did then? Well, I must be honest with you. I've had a few tickets. I've had a few SP30s. I don't know, SP30 stand, if you're 30 miles an hour and you do 38, you get a ticket because they will allow you 33 miles. I have, I've had tickets. And every time I get it, I think to myself, why am I like this? Help me, Lord. I need to talk about this and I need to really get my life together. This is wrong. When will I learn? When will I change? It's painful to my heart. I want to change. I don't want anything in my life that is an obstacle to my life, to allow God to work in my, in my life, in my heart, among, with my marriage, with my children. Do you have a perspective of, I want to be the best I can be for God? Do you have the perspective that when I think of what God is taking me to and where I've come from, how rebellious I've been, how does that make you even be eager to really honor him and serve him? You know, the Lord is faithful and thank God for that, which brings me to my second point. God he honored his promise. And I thank God for his integrity. What an amazing God we have. You know, uh, my second point is because of his love and faithfulness. Because of his love and faithfulness. 
Now, by this time, obviously, when the people are standing by the, by the Canaan land to enter it, it's almost like 600 years has gone by. Over 600 years with this interaction. Back in Genesis chapter 22, when the Lord spoke to Abraham, when the Lord tested Abraham, and Abraham walked with God, and, 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 and God just loved him. And he said, I swear, this is what the Lord said. What an amazing God we have. That he even goes to swear to us human beings. Who are we? That he should even say these things to us. And yet he honored Abraham, honors us. He said in Genesis twenty-two fifteen 15 to 18, this is what the Lord said with uplifted hands. I can't even imagine the Lord uplifting his hands and making a, a swearing by his own name. No one greater in the whole universe, in all of um, this magnificent place. And he said, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself. When I these were those words, it, my hair at the back of my neck stands. And I think to myself, my Lord declares the Lord that because you have done this, and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as the sand on the seashores. Your descendants who are standing by the, by the Canaan will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. My Lord, I think when Abraham must have heard these words, he must have walked away thinking, Lord, I don't deserve to hear these words. Incredible. Who am I that I should stand before the Almighty? And for the Almighty to make a promise to this like this to me. And we are here and we have these promises. You know, because of his love and his faithfulness, and thank God for that, that the Lord is working with you. He's walking every step of the way, not because you are righteous, because he has made a promise to walk side by side with you. As long as you're willing to be there. He will not withdraw his love from you or his faithfulness. But only, only if we should live to what we have said to him. Only as we should love him, adore him, be connected with him and live for him. You know, I, I am amazed at the Lord's incredible kindness because the very thing that he said he has called us to do. In Proverbs chapter 3 verse 3 says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. This is our very God. His love and his faithfulness endures forever. We know that song. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on your uh, tablets of your heart. Let your love to God Never fade. Your faithfulness to his commandments be on your heart. Live to please God, not man. God is faithful to you. Are we faithful to him? Am I faithful to his desires? Am I faithful to his plans? Are his plans and his hopes my hopes and my plans? Are the desires of Jesus your desires? Or is it not? Ask yourself that question. Because he's faithful. We have a wonderful and trustworthy God. In Romans 8.32, he makes another promise. He who did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him, generously give us all things. 
Well, I tell you what, I find that so inspiring, that verse. My heart is filled with so much joy. I pray that your heart is. You feel God will give me everything I need and he will take me home. Joshua recognized that and he said that in Joshua. Joshua said, not one of his promises have fallen. And, and he called the people. You know, once the Lord blesses you, will you still remain humble? When God gives you your desires, do you still turn back and think, it is he who gave it to me and he can easily take it away, but my heart is not on the blessing, it is on him. And I wanna to continue to please him, to love him and to do whatever it takes. You know, some of us may think the challenge is, I'm in a good place. I'm not in a difficult place. Everything seems to be fine. I have found in my experience, that's the most dangerous place to be. If I'm not watchful, I am very easily fallen, can fall. First Corinthians 10, 12 says, uh, you know, if you're standing strong, be careful. No temptation has ceased. That is, is not uncommon. Be careful. I want to I wanna seek that. You know, for those of us who are married couples, do you seek help? Do you still seek help in your marriage? Or have you got everything in the right place? I'm only asking. I know in my marriage, I need help. I really do need help. Coming into this area, this new environment has thrown new challenges for me and Fiona. I've had to speak to a few that, you know, I wasn't preparing three or four messages a week. I'm sometimes preparing three messages a week. I, I was never in that place. Uh, I was asked to do something for one of the regions about parenting. I was asked to do something about marriage uh, or to another region. I was asked to share some thoughts with some, some younger disciples in a different region. Do you know, I've not, been, I've not been in these places. It's caused quite a bit of a, a challenge for us. And I had to speak to a couple of brothers. Do you still seek help if you're dating? Dating brings a lot of challenges with it because there's a lot of very strong emotions involved strong desires involved. Do you still seek help? Why? Be we seek help because we want to do whatever we do that is pleasing to God, that is right, and is honoring God at every step of the way because we don't know the way. Do you seek help in your relationships? We have strained, sometimes we have strained relationships. Do you, do you, are you humble to say, look, I'm having a difficult time. What advice can you give me? What advice, can, how can you help me to, to mend my relationships? How can you help me to, to sort out these differences? I appreciate a brother last week. We, there was a couple of emails went among us and I sent an email. And my email was a bit of a, it was a bit quick, quick reply. <clears throat> it wasn't, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't the best. And this brother took it upon himself and he sent a reply to all, to everyone in there, very strong, a lot of feelings. And I thought, wow, this was quite difficult. So I sent him a pro a, an email privately. I said, perhaps we should talk because this is not the best way. And bless him, he was very humble. And he called me the following day and we spoke. And when he spoke, I needed to apologize that I had not considered his thoughts carefully and considerately. And you know what it produced? It produced an amazing humility on his part. He said, I'm so sorry. I never knew you were so much under, under so many other things, it pressures. And I just took it upon myself and I replied. But you know, it was a difficult time, but something really beautiful came out of it. And we learned not to respond immediately. Think. Ask yourself those questions. Should I respond in such a way? Is it the best reply? Can I do better? It helped me and it helped him. Uh, 
Are, are there any unresolved situations between you? Work them out. Be quick to deal with these things. Get help. Get seek, seek help. Because the God we serve, he is faithful and, and his love is constant. And through his love and faithfulness, we can also work through the details between each other. We can protect. You know, I heard this wonderful saying. The only time a brother, a disciple, will bend down is to lift somebody else up. Think about it. If one of us falls, we can go down and we can lift them up. That's our purpose, to help one another. And we have greater examples. We have the example of Jesus. His desires should take precedent over our desires because his desires are godly desires. They are good on the long, long term. They are good. They will transform us. They help us. Do you know, I've, I'm, I'm now beginning to get to know my neighbors a little bit more. I've, I've given some cards out now to the, to the, for the church, and I'm praying that people will start visiting. I've met Ryan, my mechanic now, and I'm going to go over and see him and give him a card and invite him to church. I've met Jordan, a young man who is, works at the, at the co-op next to us, and, and we had a brief conversation. He said, give me the details. I could connect. I'm a young guy. You know, I'm 20 year old. I've, my life is ahead of me. And I thought of my, I thought of Kieran. I thought of Raul. I thought of Claire and I thought of all our youth. I thought, wow, what a great blessing. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of my neighbor here, you know, Mike and, and, and Anthony, you know, just I'm beginning to connect with people again. And I want to give these cards with my name and my phone number written. Please call me, contact me. I had a conversation with a brother last night and hey, he said to me, I enjoy people. I really love people. Uh, and I, I, I completely and utterly, I think he's such a man. He loves people. And I said, why don't you, when you go to pray, pray that God will put someone in your path that we can share the gospel with. Wow. And he was saying, he said, I'm going to pray for that. Do you know, if we don't pray and if we don't align our hearts with God, how is God going to work in our lives if it's not on our minds? Let us do that. Do you know, it's incredible. I want to just take a moment, just appreciate our nurses, our doctors, our firemen, or those of you who work such difficult hours. You know, uh, I think the whole United Kingdom is learning a lesson to work together. They really are. I think begin in the beginning it was a competition between, I don't want to name them names because I don't know, I'm not political. But all the leaders were trying to say, who will do the best in our country? We do this, you do that, we have this. And we'll, then we'll see the numbers, we'll see the names. I don't think it was working very well because people were moving from place to place. But now the country is thinking we should work together. We can't have one law here, another there, and people are all over the place. People are confused. We are a united kingdom. Let's work together because we have a virus to kill. And if we are divided, the virus will overtake us. I'm sure that's how they speak behind the scene. They have to be humble and work together. They can't work disjointed. For us, we have got to be, we've got to learn from these things. We have a bigger virus. Satan is working powerfully against all of us. He's determined to drive people away. You know, are you slow if there are areas in your life to change from? Are, are there any sins that you need to deal with? Because we are in isolation too. And no one knows exactly what's going on. Are there things that are hidden? Let us help each other and deal with them. In 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow to keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Are there any, any areas 
that we need to bring to light. Let's do that. Because I hear sometimes things are coming from the woodworks. And that's dangerous. There were over 2 million people who came out of Egypt. And only two people who really honored God were eventually to, to, to enter the promised land. Everyone was wiped out. That makes me scared. Jesus himself said, many are called, but few are chosen. Fight and run the race as one who is chosen. Not just to make up numbers, brothers and sisters. Be careful in your journey. Watch out. The enemy is powerful. Proverbs 28, 13, where we'll finish soon. Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. The Lord will not break his word. The Lord will uphold his word. Let us run this race together in humility and openness. You know, in a... I, I thank God because we have an amazing savior in Christ. We have one who is far greater than Moses. One who gave his life, not just plead with God, but he gave his life and he made every, he, he provided every avenue perfect in holiness. Let's be faithful to God. He doesn't look for perfect people. He looks for humble genuine those who fear his word those who honor him and those who when they hear his word they will make the change and he doesn't have to say one two three five six echoes you know merons for that let's be those who respond i mean uh, I, I appreciate again apostle paul in first corinthians 4 14 says my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. Is your conscience clear? Our consciences are a good place. Then they need to be clear. Are there anything that are hidden? Get them out. Let's help each other. Let's build each other. Let's protect each other. We'll help you. There is nothing you can say that we haven't done. There is nothing you can say that we, are not, we have not experienced among all of us. But the goal is to be holy and righteous before the Lord. Thank you for Christ who has opened this avenue for us. From Deuteronomy chapter 9, two points. Undeserved mercy with the blessings and the future ahead. And secondly, all of this is possible because of his great love and faithfulness. Let us pray together as we take the communion. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that we come before you as a church, as your people, Lord. Father, looking at your scriptures and being reminded how wonderful you are and how kind you are. You don't give us what we deserve, Lord. Instead, you, Lord, you pour, us, pour out blessings and kindness and goodness, Lord, because, Lord, you have made a promise and you stand with your promise. Help us, Lord, that we may be the people, as we look at Jesus, as we remember, as we take, Father, the, the bread and the, and the wine, uh, Father, that reminds us, Lord, of the sacrifice, that we may walk, Father, and live a life that is pleasing to you in every way. And Lord, where we have gone wrong, please forgive us and have mercy upon us. And give us the opportunity, Lord, to really open up and share and walk cleansed before you, Lord God. We love you and praise you in Jesus' blessed name. Amen.